Good evening. Welcome to ASAL Community Church, where serving and giving begins. We look to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, who demonstrated the greatest example of service and sacrifice. We believe by following his example, we can unlock the abundance of this life and be assured about our glorious and boundless future. As we gather here today, we acknowledge the power of the triune God. We offer sincere praises to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We worship and adore the maker of the heavens and the earth. Indeed, we collectively affirm, we desire godly change in our lives. We are expecting God to meet us here in a mighty way. We are determined to leave this place wiser, stronger, more joyful, and equipped with biblical truth to help us conquer the week ahead. We expect God's best, leaning on him for daily direction and resolving to renew our minds and surrender our hearts through his word. We long to understand the true posture of worship, the power of earnest praise, the blessing of hearing the word and applying it to our lives. As we look around, we realize that serving the Lord is not confined to these walls. God gathers us here for instructions but sends us out to share the message of reconciliation. Acceptance of the shed blood of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection are essential to abundance in this life and the next. We are here to win souls for Christ. Encourage, encourage those who do not know him personally and build up believers to accept Christ's call and live a purpose-filled life. Everyone is welcome here at ASAL Community Church where serving and giving begins. Thank you. Jesus, you are, you are the center of my joy. the center of my joy, oh, 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 my joy, oh, oh, my joy, oh, my, my joy. Joy, it's the young joy. Can I go back tonight? Pass me not, old gentle Savior. Hear my heart, humble cry. While on other thou art calling, do not pass me by. Oh, say. Oh, 
me back Oh, Savior, Savior Here I humble cry While on the other thou art calling Oh, do not pass me by. Come on, everybody. Pass me not, oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, yeah. Do not pass me by. Come on, everybody. Oh, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Well, no others thou art calling. Oh, do not. Do not, do not, do not, yeah, do not, hey, oh, do not, oh, do not, oh, do not, oh, hey, do not, do not. Yeah, yeah, do not, do not pass me by. Come on, everybody. Oh, Savior, Savior, here. Do not, do not, hey, do not, Lord, I don't care what you're doing, but do not, hey, do not, oh, don't forget about me, God, oh, do not, when you're passing my blessing, do not, oh, do not. I need a healing, Lord, do not, hey, uh, do not pass me back. Oh, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Oh, Somebody ought to say hallelujah. They don't sing those songs anymore. But those are the songs that I grew up off of. Sometimes we didn't have drums. We didn't have pianos. We didn't have microphones. We would just start out and the whole church would just take it away. You have won the victory. 
story Seated in 
majesty You are the risen key Death could not hold you now Hold you down, hey. That could not hold you down. No, 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 no. Death could not hold you down, Hallelujah, you have won the victory, oh, hallelujah, you have won it all for, for me. have won it all, won it all for me. That's a good thing, ain't it? He has won it all, won it all for us. He has won it all, he has won it all, he has won it all for me. He has won it all, won it all. He's won it, won it all. Hey, he has won it all. He's won it all. He has won it. He's won it. He's won it. He's won it all. Death could not hold you down. Hey. God, we worship you this evening, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for you are our salvation, Lord God. You are our Savior, Lord God. You clothed yourself in human flesh and came to this earth and poured out your blood for us. And we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood that covers our sins, Lord God. We thank you for the blood that gives us entrance to your, to your throne room, Lord God. We thank you for the cost that was praised so we could live in your kingdom, Lord God. We thank you for the love that you expressed to us through your son, Father. Jesus, we thank you for all that you said while you were here, for all that you did while you were here, for all those that you healed, all of those that you set free. 
We thank you that we walk in deliverance. We thank you that we walk in freedom right now. We thank you that we walk in healing right now. We thank you for all that you poured out on us, Lord God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit that causes us to hear your voice, Lord God. Your Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom and understanding, Lord God. We thank you for all that you poured out on us, Father. And we worship you, Lord God. There is no one like you, Father. You are unique, Lord God. You are our creator. And as your creation, we say thank you. We say we love you. We say we worship you. We say we honor you. And we bless your holy name, Father. We give you glory. We thank you for this gathering, Lord God. We thank you for filling this place with your spirit, Lord God. We thank you for touching every soul in this place this day, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for all that you do and all that you are, Father. And we worship you. We worship you. We honor you. We love to be in your presence, Father. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand this evening. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Giving honor to my friend and my neighbor, the shepherd of this house, Pastor Rodney Johnson, and his lovely first lady. I thank you for the opportunity to come and talk, speak to your people, speak the word of God over your people. Giving honor to my wife, who is the light of my life. I thank God for her. I feel like I'm amongst fa family because I know most of, most of the people in the room, I think. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm, my name is David Barlow. I know your mother. <laughs> and your daddy, too. I know them both. That's right. Y'all did an excellent job, man. That's wonderful worship, man. Y'all really took me in this morning. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. That's solid right there. That's solid right there. Hallelujah. So we're going to get into the word this evening. And if you have your Bibles with me, if you could flip over to Luke 4, verse 30, 43, that's kind of where we're going to jump in. But Father, I thank you for this word. I ask that you, I surrender my vessel to you and ask that you bring thing, all things back to my remembrance, that you speak to your people, Lord God, because it's not my voice and it's not my wisdom that sets people free, but it is yours, Lord God. So use me as you see fit. Hide me behind the cross so they see your face in this word, Lord God, so they hear your voice in this word, Lord God. I thank you for strengthening the people, Lord God, for strengthening their understanding, for building up their faith, Lord God, for causing them to walk in your kingdom the way that you designed it to be, Father. In all things, I thank you for through, through the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So the scripture says this. He said to them, he being Jesus, said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities too, because for this purpose I have been sent. I want to talk to you today about the kingdom of God. Now, what is it about the kingdom of God? Well, let's back up a little bit. First of all, Jesus said that for this reason I, I was sent, which makes you think that this was the one reason he was sent, was to preach the kingdom of God. He didn't say he was, spent, he was sent to create a religion. He didn't say he was sent to create a church. He didn't even say he was sent to die on the cross for us. He said he was sent to preach the kingdom of God. Dying on the cross and, and building his church are necessaries to get the kingdom of God into the earth. They are the means to an end, but not the end itself. The end itself is the kingdom of God. So the quest, my question is, what is it about the kingdom of God that makes it so important that Jesus would say that this is the reason that I came? What makes it so significant that this is where Jesus would point to, and this, this is the thing that Jesus would say is his whole purpose for being, being brought to the earth? Well, I think that in order to get that answer, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to start where God started, where the kingdom was initially created. So at the beginning of Genesis, it starts out this way. In the beginning, God. Now, we have to understand that God is not a name. It's a description. It means a self-existing one. It means that God existed before anything else did, and he existed all on his own. He needed nothing for him to be but himself. We don't claim that because we need to breathe air, we need to eat food, we need to drink water. God is the only entity ever to exist that was self-existing all on his own. So it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens, which is the invisible realm. 
the invisible realm, he filled it with angels and cherubim. They worshiped him. They praised him. They did his will. They served him in every way imaginable. Countless numbers of them. But that wasn't, but after that, God decided to create the visible realm. Now, why would God do that? Is it not enough that you have all of these creatures that you've created, that they worship you with nonstop, that they praise you nonstop? The answer, we, there, there, there are a lot of things about God that we can't understand, that we can't comprehend, that we may never be able to understand. But there is one thing that the Bible tells us about God that helps us understand why he created the visible universe. And in 1 John chapter 4, it says that God is love. Love seeks to be shared. Love seeks expression. Think about when you see a puppy, a young puppy. What does that puppy do when he sees you, whether he knows you or not? He comes up, his tail is wagging, he's rubbing all up on against you, he's kissing you, he's doing everything he can because that puppy is full of love and love seeks to be shared. God is the same way because God, is, God doesn't have love like the puppy. God is love. So God decided that he was going to create spirit children and that he was going to create a physical universe to put those spirit children into. So God says, I'm going to take a part of me and I'm going to create another entity that has never existed. So God created spirit children. It says that the scripture says that he, he said, let us make man and as man and woman, he created them. Now it's important to understand what that's really saying because uh, make and create don't mean the same thing in Hebrew. In Hebrew, make means to make something new out of something that exists. Creating means that you create, you make something out of something that never existed. You create it out of nothing. So God made man in his own image. He took his character, he took his attributes, he took his, his, his way of thinking, and he created spirit children. Now the Bible says that he created them, or that he made them male and female. You have to understand that what he's making is not a physical person. He's making spirit beings. And in the spirit, there is neither male nor female. They're both, but they're neither. One of the mysteries of the Bible. Then it says that he made them, male, uh, male and female, he made them. As a result of creating the spirit beings, he caused it to turn into something that's never existed before. A spirit being that is, a spirit being that is godlike. Not gods, but God-like. That's what makes us different from the animals and everything else that God created. That's what makes us different from the angels and everything else that God created because when God created us, when he made us, he used his own self to, to build us out of. And so in a very real way, he made us God-like. Then he gave an assignment. So he has created the first kingdom. He's created the kingdom of heaven. When he created the kingdom of heaven, essentially what that did was that established the position of king. That was before then, there was no need for a king. But because he created the invisible universe, he became the king of heaven. When he created the physical universe, and then he created his spirit children, and he put them into that physical universe, he gave them assignment. He said, he said let them have dominion over the earth over all the animals, the plants. You guys know how the scripture goes. He said, let them have dominion. Not let us have dominion. Let them have dominion. So he's created these little, these, these, these spirit children that are godlike, put them into this physical universe, and then gave them godlike responsibilities. Because he said, let them have dominion. He created images of himself, the king of heaven, to rule the kingdom of earth. However, something went wrong. There was a problem. Why did God put the tree, of, uh, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Choice. If there is no choice, there is no free will. And God wanted to know, what would you choose? Think about someone who's incarcerated. In a prison, they have big high walls, big high fences. Why? to take away choice. You don't have the choice of getting out, you have to stay in. You no longer have choice, your will is to do what I tell you at that point. But God wants people to choose him, so he gave them other options in the earth. 
over the period of time, they chose to take that option. Because God had given them dominion over the earth, made them kings over the earth, when they took that option, the Bible says that whom you obey, I forget how it finishes now, now that I'm thinking about it, but whom you obey, come on, tell me. Told scholars. Yeah, <laughs> whom you, who, is it who, uh, whom you obey, them you will serve? The essence being that when they ate the apple, they, decide, they changed size. It's treason. They changed from God, they changed to Satan. And they gave the authority that they had now to the enemy. Satan even says it in, uh, where is it here? Satan says, what he, so when Satan is tempting Jesus, he tells him, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will bow down before me. And he goes on to his statement to say, because they were given to me. They were given to him by Adam and Eve when they broke their communion with God. When they changed sides, they gave their authority and their kingship over the earth to the enemy. So now when there, we have multiple kingdoms. We have the kingdom of God. We have the kingdom of Satan. We have the kingdom of man. Everybody belongs to at least one. Everybody belongs to the kingdom of man, at least. You choose which, one, which other one you're going to belong to, either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. So, so God puts them into the garden. He gives them dominion over the earth. They usurp his kingship, being kings in the earth, and they give their authority to Satan. Jesus comes to take that kingdom back. Check this out. So because, because God gave, because God said, let them have dominion instead of letting us have dominion, God can't come into the earth and do it himself. That's why everything that you see God doing in the Bible, he does through people. Because he gave people the authority on earth. They lean on him, but he gave people the authority of what's going to happen on earth. That's why they were able to give the kingdom to Satan in the first place, right? So Jesus comes, so God births Jesus into the world. And it has to happen that way. Because the man Jesus makes the God Jesus legal on earth. In Jesus, God can operate perfectly on earth because Jesus took on the form that God put over dominion over the earth. But Jesus comes, and he comes to take his kingdom back. So when Satan tells him, tempts him with all the kingdoms of the world if he'll bow down you notice that Jesus doesn't argue with him about who has the kingdoms the devil thinks that Jesus is going to bow down so he can get the kingdoms back but Jesus has a different plan he's going to pay the price for it to get the kingdoms back he pays the price for it to get the kingdoms back so that we might have access to it The thing about having access to the, the thing about having access to the kingdom of God and living in the kingdom of God means that you have power. The Bible says that the kingdom, the kingdom is power. When we live in the kingdom, we have power. Let me tell you how, how we see that in the Bible. When Jesus walks up to the tree, and it's the time that he should be bearing fruit, Jesus curses the tree and the tree dies. Jesus doesn't have to go get an axe, he doesn't have to go get a shovel, he doesn't have to do anything. He curses the tree and the tree dies. That's because Jesus operates perfectly in the kingdom, and what the kingdom gives us control over is what? What God gave us dominion over. Nature. The kingdom operates, God said, have dominion over the earth, the plants, and everything else that, that is there. Have dominion over. That means that we can, we can control it, we, we are tasked with caring for it, but that also means that we have dominion over it, meaning that we have authority over it, we, have, we control it, we can make it do what, what we want it to do. Our task is to hear what God wants us to do and do what God wants us to do with it. But time and time and time again, that's why Jesus can heal people. Because he, he, takes, he has dominion. Another character in the Bible that understands this is Paul. There is the story of Paul in the book of Acts, where Paul has been taken captive by the Romans. Now you have to understand that Paul's father is a Roman. So Paul was born a Roman, but Paul is also a Jew. So Paul is taken captive by the Romans, and they see him as an insurgent. 
because he's preaching this kingdom. This kingdom comes against the kingdom of Rome. So they take Paul and they want to torture him to get information out of him, but ultimately their goal is that they're going to kill him. So they get out that whip that has all the glass and the chains, or the glass and the hooks and all that kind of thing that, that tears flesh off, and they prepare to beat Paul with this thing, but Paul understands kingdom. Because kingdom, after all, is, so when the kingdom is formed, there is a king. That king decides what the nature of his kingdom will be. In order to get the, na the character, what's the term I'm looking for here? The culture of the kingdom to be what he wants it to be, he does what? He institutes precepts and laws and rules he sets up a way that things work, just like we do here in the United States. Our tax code is one of the biggest things that, that controls what our culture is like, because it pays you to do the, do the things that the government wants you to do, and it penalizes you for not doing those things, or for doing the opposite of them. Whatever a king comes in, it's his desire to set up his culture the way that he wants it, so he puts in rules and the way that things work in order to make that culture come about. Paul understands how this works. So when Paul is taken captive by the Romans, and they're about to beat him, Paul says, wait up, hold up. Is it lawful for you to execute a Roman? At that point, these soldiers who are just chomping at the bit to beat Paul, they all stop, and they go get their commander. They bring their commander out. They're, so, they're, they're scared of Paul now. They were about to kill him, now they're scared of him. They go get their commander, they bring their commander out, and their commander says, tell me true, are you a Roman? Paul says, yes. The commander says, it cost me a lot of money to become a Roman. Paul says, I was born a Roman. Now he has authority over them. And he tells them, I want to go see Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he understands that as a Roman citizen, it is his right to be able to go see Caesar. So he tells them, I want to go see Caesar. I want to talk to Caesar about what you were about to do to me as a Roman. All the guards and the prison, and all the guards are now afraid. And they're asking him, don't do that. Can't we take you to Pontius Pilate or can't we take you to somebody else that you can talk to? You don't have to go and talk to Caesar. He says, no, I want to go talk to Caesar. I don't have to stop to a middleman. I can go straight to the source. Because that's the way kingdom works. That's the way kingdom works. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Because that's the way the kingdom works. So Paul, they get ready to take Paul to Rome to see Caesar. On the way to Rome, He's on a ship with the other prisoners, and, there's, and the ship goes down to the sea. But Paul knows that he's on a mission for, that, that is called for by God, and understanding how kingdom works, Paul knows that he can't, com he can't complete that mission if he doesn't get to Rome, so Paul knows that he's not going to die. And he tells the other prisoners, if you stay with me, you won't die either. Kingdom, if you understand how kingdom works, it not only works for you, but it can work for the people around you, if you understand how kingdom works. So Paul, so they all, st they all stay around Paul, they all make it to shore. Some of them just barely, some of them on sticks, you know, you know how the story goes, but they all make it to shore. They all live. They gather up food from the shipwreck, and they're sitting around a fire, and they're cooking the food and about to eat. Paul reaches into the logs to take another log out of the fire, and a viper latches onto Paul's arm. Now this is a viper that should kill Paul in about three minutes. Paul takes the viper, shakes it off, and throws it into the fire. Keeps on eating. Meanwhile, all the other prisoners are sitting around. They're watching, waiting for Paul to die. But the way, because Paul operates in the kingdom, he knows that he can't die, so either one of two things happen. Either the venom did not come out of the, out of the snake, or Paul's system overwhelmed the venom. Because it doesn't even say that Paul got sick. It says that Paul shook the, the snake off, and he went on doing what he was doing. When, when they get to Rome, and Paul goes into Caesar, the guards take him in. Paul explains to Caesar what's going on. This is the, the head guy in Rome. This is the guy who makes all, calls all the shots. Caesar tells Paul, he apologizes to Paul for what's happened. Now mind you, remember, Paul started off where? About to be killed. About to be executed in the worst possible way. Now he's standing in front of Caesar, and Caesar is apologizing to Paul for what, he, for what they did to him. Not only does Caesar apologize to Paul, but he tells Paul, I'm going to give you a house right here in Rome, and I'm going to send these guys back to fight the war. So Caesar sets Paul up in Rome in a house, and from that house, Paul writes most of the New Testament. Because Paul understands how the kingdom operates. Paul understands how kingdoms operate. 
Jesus says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Not to the kingdom, of the kingdom. Kingdoms are set up to have rules and, and regulations and precepts and ways that they operate. If you understand well how those things work, you can take those things and apply them to your life, and you can fix your life where it's broken, and you can get in a position to carry out what God has called you to do. But you have to understand what the keys are, how the keys work, and what, what they accomplish. Most of us, we have the keys, we've seen the keys, we know the keys, but we're stuck at the door because we don't know how to make the key, key work. So we start experimenting, and we tap on the door down here, and it's, I'm healed, by, the, by his stripes I'm healed. We tap on the door up there, by his stripes I'm healed. We tap on the door over there, by his stripes I'm healed. We stick the key in this way, by his stripes I'm healed. We stick the key in that way, by his stripes I'm healed. We kick on the door, by, the, by his stripes I'm healed, not realizing that just saying it doesn't make it work for you because you're still sick. So obviously just saying it doesn't make it work. There has to be more to it. There has to be more to it. There has to be a faith component to it. You can't just say it. There has to be a faith component to it, and you have to line up with what the rest of the word says. The word warns a husband not to, what does it say? It says not to, not to carry, something along the lines of not to carry anger towards your wife, or your prayers will be blocked. So being angry towards your wife locks up heaven. And it doesn't matter how many times you name it and claim it, how many times you want it, how bad you pray for it, or anything else that you do, it is not going to unlock for you because of something else that has locked up your prayers. So you have to understand not only what, what the keys are, but how the keys work and how they work together. But Jesus said he left us the keys of the kingdom. And one of the keys that he left us is wisdom. Every story in the Bible, every story in the Bible shows how keys work. And if you approach them, just like that story with Paul, if you approach them looking and asking God, why is this happening? What, could, what, 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 what alternative thing could have happened? Why did it happen this way? What was the benefit of it? What unlocked it? What made it happen? Where, did, where, where are you in it? Then those keys will start to make themselves known to you. That's why it tells us, study to show yourself approved. But we have to be willing to get in there and do it. Jesus says this in Matthew. It says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be, bound, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Initially, it was thought that this was talking about getting, opening the door to heaven to get people in and closing the door to keep people out. That is why the Roman Catholic Church, they pray to Paul, and they, they, they do things like that because the keys of the kingdom were given to Peter, rather. Not Paul, but Peter. Um, but it means a lot more than that. You can unlock blessings for your life here on earth by walking out the gospel. And as you walk out the gospel here on earth, it unlocks those blessings in heavens, and those things are translated from the supernatural into the natural. They come from the kingdom of God into the kingdom of man, or the kingdom of God on earth, and as a result, they come into your life. The opposite is also true. Through disobedience and sin, we lock up heaven, or we lock up our own lives here on earth. The result is heaven agrees with that, and heaven locks up against us. So we have to understand how the keys work. We have to know what they are and how they work and how we use them. The church is shrinking. It's not growing. It's shrinking. People are turning to alternative methods to fill that, that hole in their soul, that thing that they can't define, that thing that they don't know where it is, they don't know where to find it. But what they don't see is they don't see the church as the answer. The reason that they don't see the church as the answer is because they don't see the church as walking in victory. They don't see the church as being any different from the world. And I believe that a large part of the reason that they don't see the church as being any different from the world is because we're not kingdom-minded. And I think one of the reasons that we're not kingdom-minded is because we don't teach kingdom. Now, 
don't get me wrong, don't, don't take this the wrong way, because I absolutely believe that Calvary and the cross is absolutely necessary. It is essential for salvation. That is the way Jesus said that I am the door. That is the only way anybody comes to know God. It's through that, it's the self-revelation of God, meaning that God revealing himself to people. However, you can't stay at the cross. From, at some point, you have to move from the cross to the kingdom. And you start, have to start living that thing out. And when people see the effect of the kingdom on your life, then they start wondering what's going on. Because you see, in the kingdom, there is abundance. So when the world is at war, the kingdom is at peace. Because Jesus said that my kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when the world is miserable, the kingdom is in joy. When the world is in lack, the kingdom is in, is in overflow. When we live in kingdom, your life is different. You look different. People see that difference and they want to know, how can I get out of this chaos that I live in in the world and get into the peace that you live in? How is it that when you come to work, you're always just like this? Well, everybody else is up and down and bumping heads and screaming and hollering at each other. Nobody gets along, but you're always in the middle. It's because I, I, I live in kingdom. People want to know when, when, when an accident happens, when you're out in traffic and they're riding in your car with you and everybody else is blowing up because I-20 has shut down. People want to know, why are you so calm? Everybody else is stressed out, maxed out. They flipping the bird, doing everything else they can think of, but you're just there mellowing out because their kingdom is the world. My kingdom is the kingdom of God, and I live there. The way we change the world is we live in the kingdom of God and we let the kingdom of God live in us. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this, for this word, Lord God. I ask that you would seal it in our hearts, Father, that you would make it plain, that you would, that you would cause it to come back to our members, that you would guide our footsteps, that you would give us a deeper understanding of the, of the keys of the kingdom. I ask that you would cause us to live in your kingdom that you would cause us to operate in your kingdom, that we can accomplish the mission that you put us here for. Your great commission says that we should go out and preach your gospel to all of the world. You said that you desire that none would be lost, but that all would come to know you. We stand in agreement with that. And as we operate in your kingdom, we believe that that will be manifest in the world. So we surrender ourselves to you today. We surrender ourselves to your kingdom. The one that your son came and won back for us. We thank you for every opportunity to use the keys. We thank you for every understanding of how to use them. And we thank you for victory over the enemy. The victory over our own selves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the whole purpose for all of this is that none should be lost. Right? We want everybody to know Jesus as their Savior. That's why we do this. Does anybody here not know Jesus as their Savior? That, that feels him tugging on their heart this evening. All hearts are good. Amen. Praise God. That's good news to hear. It is offering time. Now, in the kingdom, in the kingdom, like I said, there are, there are rules that are set up as if-thens. If you do that, then this will, be the, this will be the result. One of those rules is give and it shall be given to you. But not just given to you, but pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. So if you give God... Just as when God gave man dominion over the earth, he could not cross that line and take dominion over the earth itself. God must honor his word. So if he says that if you give, that it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing, or running over, then that's what's going to happen. But in the kingdom, we have, to, we have to operate on that. You can't just sit back and think about it. You have to do it. And this is the opportunity to give it to the kingdom. I believe uh, we have the envelopes the white envelopes. I think there are some of the backs of the chairs. I believe you can give online. I'm hoping you can. 
Oh, there it is, right. You can, you can give online. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a chance to get that together while I get mine together. Because uh, I could use some overflow in my life. Especially with the economy being what it is right now. I need some overflow in my life. So if you finish, hold your envelope or your device up in the air. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give into your kingdom. We thank you that we, we pray that you would take these funds and that you would multiply them in your kingdom, that you would use them for your purposes. We thank you for doubling them back to us. Uh, for the overflow, Lord God, we thank you for that we can lean on you and depend on you because you're consistently dependable, Father. We thank you that we trust you, that we can trust you because you're consistently dependable. We thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you for the ability to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm going to speak this blessing over you and we're going to call it an evening. Pull the blessing up here. Did you learn anything this evening? Just as I'm looking for it, I can't find it. I know it's here somewhere, though. Oh, there it is. The blessing of the Lord is yours. Peace, prosperity, and joy of the Holy Spirit. Your married life is whole and healthy in God. Your single life is whole and healthy in God. Your children are best blessed. Your business is blessed. Your job is blessed. Everything you put your hands to is blessed. Everywhere your feet shall tread, you will possess. Wherever you find yourself, you are not the problem, but you are the solution to the problem. Peace is your portion. Finances come your way, and, just not, and not just finances, but the wisdom to use them. The love of God fills you, and his grace overwhelms you. The wisdom of God is yours. The favor of God pursues you. The strength of God sustains you. The power of God preserves you, and the hand of God protects you. You clearly hear the voice of God, and your submission to his voice is unrestrained. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>